Chapter 24, and starting at verse 13, sing it, say it with me all the way down to verse 21. Are we ready? Luke 24, verse 13 to 21, all together. And behold, two of them went that same day into a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides, all this today is the third day since these things were done. Subject this afternoon, turning disappointments into appointments. Turning disappointments into appointments. Take now lips of clay, speak a word, we pray today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in his presence. Amen. I want to submit to you today that most of us, if not all of us, have ex has experienced something that has brought you a disappointment. Can I get a witness? You may have been displaced, disrupted, disabled, dismayed, disadvantaged, and even discouraged, but I came here to submit to you today that God has the amazing ability to transform a disappointment into an appointment. Good to see you, Sister James, visiting with Sister Elvin. Let's give her a hearty amen. He can take that which was meant for evil and turn it for your good and his glory. For with God, 
and adversity can make you better if you don't let it make you bitter. A setback, Pastor Gouda, can become a setup for a comeback. Adversities really can become the props that God uses to get his will done. Adversity can provide opportunity. Bricks thrown at you can become stepping stones. One man learned that his name is Bernie Marcus, and he discovered this when he got fired from a place called Handy Dan, a do-it-yourself hardware store. He got fired, but it prompted him to start his own business. He seemed to understand that when one door shuts, God can open up another door to Neil. And so today, he, Bernie Marcus, employs over 157,000 people in his company, which does more than $30 billion in sales annually. And if, because Bernie uh, would tell you here today that it, he, if he never got fired, he would have never been able to hire some people. What you, we are really looking at is that a disappointment was transformed into an appointment. Can I get a witness? See, adversity can become opportunity. Now, I don't know if Handy Dan is still around, but I've heard of Home Depot. And that's Bernie's place. And it's not just surviving, it's thriving. Because when God is in it, great things are done. What do you say? Now, I see two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, heads down and disappointment. I want to say to people getting baptized and to people of faith that you and I have got to be willing to be people of faith even when we sense that situations are not going our way. Your GPS needs to be kept current to the moving of God's Holy Spirit so that he can navigate you continually. What do you say? Your spiritual antenna must be tuned in to the frequency of God's spirit. For God wants to guide us to fulfill his purpose in us. And I thank God for his word that guides us. What do you say? Somebody said it is a lamp to the feet and a light to your path. And then you and I must be willing to hear what the spirit has to say. Now, many times in Scripture, Jesus has rebuked his disciples for their unbelief. But in this text, he rebukes two of them because they are slow to believe. Did you get that? See, being slow to believe uh, can be a dangerous thing. It's not that they had unbelief. They were slow to believe. In other words, their faith was lagging behind what God had already said would happen. And that's why they were walking to Emmaus with heads down. You see, they missed the opportunity to glorify a risen Savior. It'll make sense to you in a minute. They did not believe what God said would happen. Okay, you'll be with me in just a minute. I'm saying that we miss blessings when we are not in step with what God has revealed to us in his word. See, God had already told them, turn to Matthew. What book did I say? Matthew chapter 26. What chapter? And I want to look there at verse, hmm, a verse where Jesus had already told them in verse 31, he told them that he would be crucified. He said in verse 31, all you shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Don't miss that. God already told his disciples, listen, they're going to come arrest me in Gethsemane, try me in a kangaroo court, come on and talk to me, beat my back like a raw steak, put, put a cross on my back, take me up dead man's hill, put nails in my hands and nails in my feet, put me in the grave, but death can't keep me in the ground because I'm coming back up on Sunday morning. Come on, talk to me. And he not only told them that he would rise again, but he told them, meet me in Galilee. So why is it that Christ's followers 
are walking to Emmaus with heads down. I'll tell you why. They didn't hear what the Spirit said. And because of the situation that they were going through, they forgot what God already told them in his word. It's a dangerous thing to not be in step with the word of God. I'll help you with that again. God told them Jesus is going to die, but he'll rise again. Meet me in Galilee. But here you have two disciples on their way to Emmaus. But aren't you glad that even when you're on the wrong road, Jesus will join you on the wrong road? Come on and talk to me. He told them, Galilee. But here they are going to Emmaus. How many of you are glad to know that when you're on the wrong road, Jesus will come your way? Mm. Mm -mm -mm. And I, I know you look nice today and all sabbatical and you look all cute. And some of you say that you were born in the church. But let me tell you, no man can come unto the Father except the Father draw him. So but you may have been born on the third pew. But let me say this. If you're in Christ today, it's because the Father drew you. You're not here because of mama and papa. You're in Christ because he drew you. Come on and talk to me. And some of us were on the wrong road, but the text says that he joined them because my God is willing to put aside some things and he'll go that far to, to save you because he sees something in you that he wants to save. Some of us were on the road to addiction. Crackheads. Some of us were cracked pots full of pot. But God met us on that road. What do you say? And sobered us up. Some of us were on the wrong financial road. Robbing God of, of, of his due. Paying our rent and our mortgage too with God's tithe. Come on and talk to me. On the wrong road. I guess mighty quiet when you talk like that. But God will come your way and help you to turn around. He'll fix you so that you can recalculate. Come on and talk to me. And come back to where he wants you to be. Aren't you glad for a God like that? Who finds you on the wrong road. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ was prepared to die for us. And he didn't wait till we got straight. He set the table for you so that when you did get straight, you could come and sit at the table. Aren't you glad for a God like that? That when you're on the wrong road. Now what they're doing on the wrong road? Because they were not following scripture. The word already said he would die. But we trusted that it would be he who would deliver us. Let me say this. A wrong interpretation of the Bible text can get you on the wrong road. Mm -hmm. I hear people and even preachers telling me that we don't have to keep God's Ten Commandments. Have you ever heard of that? that they were nailed to the cross. And then they'll give me a text like if he, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Here you go, pastor. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, nailing it to his cross. And then it goes on to say, therefore let no man therefore judge you in meats. What it's really saying is meat offerings, which was not even meat. Well, let me come down here and help you. If you turn to Leviticus 23, you'll discover that the meat offering was not even flesh food. It was flour, dumplings, johnny bread, pancakes. Are you getting the picture? It was not lamb or wham. Thank you, ma'am. It No, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> It was meat offerings and drink offerings. And then, here we go, and let no man therefore judge you with respect of an holy days or new moons or, here it is, pastor, Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Thank you. The text just explained itself. Because the Sabbath of the Lord, which comes weekly, is not a shadow of anything. It was talking about annual Sabbaths. Can I give you a few? 
Passover was an annual Sabbath. And the reason why they celebrated that one is because they were to remember that the death angel passed over their house. And every year they had to thank God that he passed over. Can I get a witness? Anybody thankful that Jesus is your Passover? That the devil could have took you out but you're still here? Come on and talk to me. So once a year, a Sabbath. Could have fell on any day, like today, 24th of May, falls on Sunday. I'm, I'm sorry, Saturday. I'm, I mean the Sabbath, which is the same thing, by the way. <laughs> Seventh day of the week. Uh-huh. And I, uh, just, just a commercial here. I hear some people say, well, how do we know which day is Sunday? I feel like asking, how, how do you know which day is your payday? You don't get that mixed up, do you? And if your boss got it mixed up, you have a few words with him. Can I get a witness? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you already told me that he rose on the first day of the week. And there are only seven days in the week. And they rested on the seventh day according to the commandment. And you celebrate the Lord because he rose on the first day. Yet you don't know which, way, which day is the seventh day. Oh, get real with me. Come on now. Talk to me. You know what day is the first day, but you, you forget the, first, the seventh day. Well, let me help you. It's Sunday. I mean Saturday. I mean the Sabbath of the Lord. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and all that in them is. And he did that before seven-day Adventists were on the planet. He did that before Moses went to Mount Sinai. He did that before there was ever such a thing as a Jew. He did that before there was ever such thing as sin. He did that when Adam and Eve got married on the sixth day. Hallelujah. And they went on the honeymoon, and, and Adam woke up and said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth, or oh, enter into his gates. All the men said, amen, with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Because why? The Lord rested the seventh day, and he blessed the seventh day, and he made that one holy, and there was no sin there. And God doesn't get tired. But he gave a weekly appointment to everybody on the planet. And I said everybody because the Sabbath was made, not made for Jews. If you want to go that way, marriage was made for Jews. Because he gave both marriage and the Sabbath on the same day. He said, get married. Tomorrow we're going to church. And, 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 and that was two institutions that the, that the devil has messed with, too. But I don't hear anyone say that marriage is for the Jews. But the Sabbath is for the Jews. The Sabbath is for man, and not man for the Sabbath. And the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So the Lord's day is the day that he is Lord of. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor, do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So what I'm saying is there is a weekly Sabbath and there are annual Sabbaths that could have come on any day of the week. And Passover was one of them. The other, and, but we don't have to celebrate Passover anymore because Christ died on a cross and he is my Passover. And by the way, if you celebrate that day still, you are denying your faith in Christ. That was only a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. How many of you are thankful that Jesus died on the cross? Shed his blood so that you can pass from death to life. Anybody in Christ today? Because he that has the son has life. Can I get a witness? Any, any alive people in here? So Passover was one. Feast on, on, of unleavened bread was the other. And of course, that's why we celebrate communion. You do know that he is the bread of life. Come on and talk to me. So he instituted communion to take the, and, and not mass. It's not the actual body of Christ. It represents his brokenness. It represents that he was broken so that you could be made whole because by his stripes I'm made healed. Come on and talk to me. And so I'm thankful for the cross. I'm thankful for communion. I'm also thankful for the wave offering. You know what the wave offering was? And see, the, 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 and, and these, were, these were feast days. You can read it in, in Leviticus 23 or you can come to my next seminar. Which it, 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 it could almost start tomorrow night. That's, that's how I'm feeling up in here. 
Uh, I, I see some, some of my members saying, but pastor, I don't have that feeling. I understand. <laughs> the wave offering, third one in line, represented the fact that when the Jews had a crop, a harvest, they took what is called the first fruits, and they gave it to the priest, and the priest waved it as a thank offering before the Lord. I got news for you. That was fulfilled for when Christ got up from the grave, your Bible says that he led captivity captive. You know what that means? That means that when he died and rose again, others got up out of the grave. You read that in Matthew 27. That's awesome. What that is actually saying is Jesus took some, he ripped off the grave and took some trophies with him to let us know that he's got power over death, hell, and the grave. He got the keys in his pocket. Come on and talk to me. So that, yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't need to fear any evil. Why? He's been there, done that, got the keys, and so if I have to die, he'll bring me out. No wonder the Bible says that you're blessed if you die in the Lord. Why? Because if you go down in the Lord... You're going to come up in the Lord on resurrection morning. Can I get a witness in this place? And so he, wa- he took those trophies, first fruits, before the Lord, and he weighed them as a thank offering to let the rest of us know that there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. It's not over. The service is not over. Of the land. Yeah. There is power, help me sing it, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Somebody was waking up for the benediction. No, not yet. We're almost there. Okay. So, so that's three down. That's three down. He's your Passover. You ought to celebrate communion and not avoid it. Mm-hmm. Because you're remembering that he was broken so that you can be made whole. Mm -hmm. Anybody who would do that for you, you ought to come to the table running. Come on and talk to me. You ought not run from the table. You ought to come to the table. Amen. And then the wave offering says that he conquered death. And that if you have to die, he can save you too. So they celebrated those three annually. They were called Sabbaths. Annual Sabbaths. They were given on certain days of the week. You couldn't work on those days. It could have come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And if it came on the Sabbath, it was a high day in Zion. Come on and talk to me. But then you had Pentecost. And basically, Pentecost was 50 days after the cross. And the Holy Spirit was outpoured. We don't have to celebrate that on that day anymore. You can thank God for the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. And do you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you were baptized? Come on and talk to me. And if you got the Holy Ghost, you got power. Anybody got power in this room? So the Holy Ghost was poured out. And I thank God he wants to give us a double portion today. And then you have what you call the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets were 10 days before the Day of Atonement to blow the trumpet to warn the people that judgment is coming. And it represents the preaching of the gospel. And I'm so privileged as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor to be able to preach the everlasting gospel, which is found in Revelation chapter 6, chapter, chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, uh, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. Why? Because the hour of his judgment is come. Now let me get back to my subject. So I I just put that in to let you know that the ceremonial law was annual. And there are two more in case you think I forgot. The day of atonement. The Jews call it Yom Kippur, representing judgment because God is judging. And of course the last one is the Feast of Tabernacles where they were to go and live in a tent for about a week to to remind them that this is not their final home. That you and I are pilgrims passing through. And that as Christians, we ought to travel lightly. And don't be so tied to earthbound destinies. Because the day is coming when you're going to fly away. Not on Delta. But when the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So let's get back to the sermon. So here are these disciples disappointed because they did not follow the word of the Lord. And even when Jesus showed up beside them, they didn't even recognize that they were in his presence. Whoa. When you get off from the word, God can be with you, talking to you, and you still don't even know it. That's a dangerous place to be. Because God kind of walks with us and talks to us. And by the way, God comes to church. That's why in the seven churches, he says to every church, hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches, which means that you and I need to tune in to what the Spirit is saying to you and I, which means that spiritual things have to be spiritually discerned, which means that you can't really enjoy your Christianity or your religion until you, you know that he walks with you and that he talks with you. Can I help you? Your Christianity is not about a bunch of rules and regulations. Christianity is about a relationship. And in relationships, people talk. And that's why you ought to hear his voice. And that's why he said, grieve not his spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. But here they were, in the presence of Jesus, on the wrong road, and they still didn't know that they were in his presence. In fact, he walked them all the way. He started to open up the scriptures. He said, O oh, fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have written. So it's a dangerous thing to get away from what the prophets have written. That's why I belong to a church, Sister Gibbons, that believes in keeping all Ten Commandments. In fact, you'll find that true church in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth, angry with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who are they? They keep the commandments of God, all ten of them. Not seven, not eight, not nine, but ten. And Sister Cain's giving that powerful Revelation seminar children's story <laughs> to the little children. Reminding us adults that if you search the pages of history, you'll read pages from their documents that say things like this. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change ever happened took place in the first century. The Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any instructions from the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own authority. And then they published this. In 1995, same article, in May, 1995, in May. Hmm. Ah. And those who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday, I mean Saturday, holy. They said that. Let me tell you what else they said. Because you need to hear this. Because you're living in the last days. And it's coming, like it or not. They also said, watch this, Sunday is our mark of authority. And our church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. I've got a little book in my bag if you want to see it. It's called the Catholic Catechism. You open it up, it says, which day is the Sabbath? It says, Saturday is the Sabbath. Why then do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Saturday instead of Sunday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Oh, yeah? But guess what? Long before they tried to do that, the, the early edition, the Bible, told us they would try to do it. Come on and talk to me. I'm in the book of Daniel now. You got to keep up with this preacher. Daniel 7, 25. And he shall think that he has the power to change times and laws. I couldn't give you the whole thing so that you don't, you don't think I'm making this up. See, Daniel saw a vision in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 3. He saw four beasts. Don't get scared of these beasts. They're like cartoon characters, okay? Four beasts coming up out of the sea, diverse or different from one another. 
The first was like a lion, second like a leopard, third like a bear, fourth like a like a, like a, like a, a nondescript beast. And then it says um, that these beasts, which are four, are four kings that shall arise out of the earth. And then it says the fourth, king, king, fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. So a beast in Bible prophecy is a king or a kingdom. And then it goes on to say, and I saw another little horn had a big mouth speaking blasphemous things against the Most High. Who is the Most High? God is the Most High. They were blaspheming the Most High. Now let's give you a Bible definition for blasphemy. Jesus stood up one day in the midst of all those church folk and said, I and my Father are one. And the Bible says in verse 31, and the Jews took up stones to stone him. And he said, hold up, before you kill me, which, for which good work are you stoning me? And they said, for a good work we're not stoning you, but because you, being a man, make yourself God. That's blasphemy. The fact of the matter war is, he is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Can I get a witness in this place? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the world, and the world didn't know him. He became flesh and walked among us. He pitched his tent among us. What manner of man is this who can moonwalk on water? Come on and talk to me. He's God all by himself, yet he wrapped himself up in human flesh, lowered the voltage of God's voice so that God's speech would not call new worlds into orbit. Hmm. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he hob not. And that's why today you have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of your infirmities, but because he knows what it's like to be lied on. He knows what it's like to be uh, cussed on, spat in his face, crucified. So, new believers, when you go through something and some insensitive church folk hurts your feelings, you'll rise again. Don't get, don't get discouraged. Come on and talk to me. Okay, Pastor, get to the sermon, please. So here we have, don't even know where I am now. Oh, Daniel. See, I got into Daniel. Yeah, that's what got me in there. So I can give you all of that, but let me, let me give you back to the sermon, and I'll close. God turned their disappointment into a point, an appointment. He walked them all the way to Emmaus, and he acted like he was going to keep on walking. And he said, no, join us. The day was almost finished. And when he went inside and washed his hands and sat down and folded his arms, they said, I've seen somebody do that before. Because they still didn't know it was Jesus. Because sometimes when you're discouraged and downtrodden, you can't see that God is with you. I got a word for you. When you are going through your stuff and you've reached the end, Christ is nearest to you. It doesn't feel like it, but you got to have faith. Because the Christian does not live, live by feeling, he lives by faith. And when they saw how he broke the bread and cracked that fish, they realized, it's Jesus. And then they went running back and told the disciples. Jesus turned that disappointment into an appointment, and the disciples went out blazing trail and preached the gospel. What does that mean to you and I? I'm a member of a church that was birthed on, by the clock of prophecy. They were Christians from every walk of life, Methodists, Baptists, Pentecostals. And when they read the prophecies in Daniel, they said, man, this 2300-day prophecy, Daniel 8:14, is awesome. Because why? God is an on-time God. And the Bible predicted that the Jews would be set free on time. That's when the prophecy was to begin. And that took place in 550, 557, no, I'm sorry, 457 B.C., all right? And it took place on time because when God's word says something, it comes to pass. And the prophecy said, listen, the Jews would have 490 years of probationary time to be my people. But 483 years into the experience, Christ will show up and get baptized. And in A.D. 27, on time, Jesus shows up and says, John, baptize me. And he gets baptized. 
And the Bible says he came to confirm the covenant with many for one week because they had a prophetic week left, seven years left before the time was up. But the Bible also says that in the midst of the week, he will cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. Half of seven is three and a half. Am I right about it? And his ministry was for three and a half years. Am I right about it? And three and a half years after his baptism, they rejected him and put him on a cross. But when they put him on a cross, he knew that they still had time left over. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. I'm dying for them, and they're crucifying me. And now they have three and a half years left. And they're persecuting the church. And Stephen is preaching. And they're rejecting Stephen. And they stone Stephen. And that gives up the time. A.D. 34. Their time is up. But I'm so glad that when the Jews rejected him, he said, your house is left unto you desolate. I'll build my church. And upon, the, upon this rock, the gates of hell shall not prevail. What do you say? But the prophecy went on down and it ended in 1844. And there were a group of people that said, listen, if the Jews were set free on time and Jesus was baptized on time and crucified on time and the, the Jews' probation was ended on time, certainly at the end of this prophecy, something's going to happen. What was the word? The word said, unto 2,300 days or years, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And they thought that the sanctuary was the earth. So they were preparing for the second coming of Christ because everything else came to pass. So something's got to take place in 1844. Are you with me? I know I'm giving you a whole lot to chew on. It's better than going to another church or somewhere and just getting milk. You need, you need something to chew on. Come on and talk to me. So they were looking for Christ to come. And it's symbolized in that little book, that book of Daniel, that's now in the hands of the angel in Revelation chapter 10. And John told them, eat the little book of prophecy. And they ate the book, and it was sweet in the mouth. Meaning, when they learned the prophecy that Jesus was coming again, it was sweet. By the way, I wonder if that's good news to us, that Jesus is coming again. Is that sweet to you? Or do you want more time to do your thing? But for some of us, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and we're praying, even so, come Lord Jesus, so we can get rid of those bills. Come on and say amen. So, 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 so they ate the little book. It was sweet in the mouth, but bitter in the belly. It is known in history books as the great disappointment. They went back to the scriptures, and when they saw, that there's a thing called the cleansing of the sanctuary, that the priests moved from holy to most holy. They said, maybe that's what God is doing. And they found a text in Daniel 7 that he went from holy to most holy. And now he's not just forgiving sin, but he's sitting in the most holy place. I know you don't understand all of this, but listen to the preacher. Right now, Christ is doing a work of intercession for us. He's cleansing the sanctuary. What does that mean, preacher? See, it's one thing to confess your sins. It's another thing to, to forsake those sins. And so all of us who have professed him, our names are written in the book of life, but so are your sins. And that's why Revelation 3 verse 5 is so important. To him that overcometh, will I, I will, to him that overcometh, I will give white raiment and I will not blot his name out of my book. Which means that everybody talking about heaven and going. What I'm trying to say is this. Once saved, always saved is not true unless you behave. It's one thing to profess, it's another thing to practice. And when your practice does not match your profession, you can lose your name in the book of life. Because names can go in and names can count them out. But the Bible also says in, in, in Acts chapter 3 verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted. Why? That your sins may be blotted out. And to be converted means you've been changed. I heard you sing about it this morning. Changed. And so the greatest need for the church is that he will change us. Come on and talk to us. That we will not just confess him, but we will be converted. That our sins may be blotted out. So there's a blotting out taking place. And God is going over the book so that when he comes to your name in the judgment, if you're faithful to him, I didn't say perfect, I said faithful. He is perfect. And if you're faithful, he will perfect you. Mm -hmm. And if you are, he will say, Father, my blood... And he'll blot the sins out of your name will remain. What do you say? What I'm trying to say is when they saw that work, the next verse in chapter 10 of Revelation says, 
thou must prophesy again. What I want to say to you is this. Even the mistake of misinterpreting the scripture was allowed by God and part of his plan, which means that your mistakes and the things that you do wrong, don't worry about it, get back up again. Because he can take your disappointment and turn it into an appointment. A setback is a setup for a comeback. And when they saw their mistake and they got it right, they started preaching the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And they said, come on in. Come out of Babylon and come into the remnant church. And I'm so glad that we've had the privilege over these seven weeks of explaining what you just got in 30 minutes. Come on and talk to me. And many women, boys and girls around the world are hearing the everlasting gospel. Come out of Babylon. Why? Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And today, men are drunk on the wine of Babylon. Wine represents doctrines. That's why I left where I was, and now I'm sober by the word of God. Because I too was drunk, believing that another man other than Jesus Christ was the lion of the tribe of Judah. There's only one lion of the tribe of Judah, and when John looked, it was a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And there's only one that was worthy to receive my praise. He died on a cross, and he rose again, and his name is Jesus, and there are nail-scarred hands. That's the one, and he's worthy. He breaks chains. He sets captives free. question today is, would you be free from your burden of sin? There is power. In the blood. Can I get a witness? Put your hands together for Jesus. He is worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory and honor and power. That's why I don't bow down to no man and I don't need no mark of the beast. I need the seal of God. By the way, when Rome was changing that day, you read it in a book called Great Controversy that the churches of Africa would not bow down. Somebody ought to give Africa a hearty amen. Woo! Africa's been used in a mighty way. When Jesus was a little baby and, and Herod got word that a king was being born on his turf, he told us, wise man, when you get down there to Bethlehem, send me a text so that I can know where he is, so that I can worship him. That fox was not about to worship him. He wanted to take him out because he was threatened that somebody was on his turf. You talk about gang warfare. And so when they met with Jesus and worshiped him, that night somebody got a dream and said, don't go back to Herod. He ain't no true worshiper. He's wicked. Go home another way, which lets me know that when you meet Jesus, he'll send you home another way. Because you can't be the same when you meet Jesus. Come on and talk to me. So they went home through the tracks. Uh-huh. And, they, and they, they sent out the death squad and tried to, and killed off male children two years and under. But the word was already out. And, and Mary and Joseph put a little off, church offering together and took Jesus to Africa to hide him, which means something. If you're going to take him to Africa to hide him, What I'm trying to say, Africa was used to save baby Jesus. And Africa has also preserved the true Sabbath. But the point being of the pastor's frail sermon today is that God turns disappointments into appointments. So never mind your mistakes. Never mind your shortcomings. Get back up. Rise again. Fight another day. Go in Jesus' name. And anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Come on and talk to me. So, so that's why we want to sing a little song. I don't know what they have prepared, but I, I, I'm asking the Lord to lead people and to guide people into his truth. And that's what the Spirit of the living God wants to do, even today. And so when a preacher like Mandos gets up to preach, I'm not asking you to join a church today. I'm asking you to hook up with Jesus, the Lord of the church. 
the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. I just love that, good. I just, you know I love it. Good, you know I love it. You know I love it. Because if he can conquer death, he can handle your problems. He can handle your habits. He can touch your life. He can turn your, your disappointment into an appointment. And what the devil meant for evil, mm, when God sticks his finger in there, he turns it around for your good. <laughs> oh, you want to pray? Let's put your hands together and praise my Jesus. Ain't nobody like him. Ain't nobody like the good Lord. So you ought not be afraid of him. He died for you. How many people would do that for you? He left glory. Didn't have to do it, but came down here to this dark spot of a world, this dirty tennis ball spinning on its axis. And he shed his precious blood to redeem people like you and me. I don't know about you, but I've made up my mind. Ain't nothing going to stop or block me from going to heaven. I'm not even going to let Cam Mandel stop me. He's going to have to get out of the way. Come on and talk to me. Because my mind is made up. My heart is fixed. I got to see Jesus one day. Anybody feel like they want to see Jesus one day? He's a liberator. He'll set the captive free. Father in heaven, today, my brothers and my sisters in my land, this land that you gave us, Nice place, beautiful, but it's not paradise. It's full of sin, sorrow, suffering, and sickness, but we thank you for a Savior. And today, somebody walked in here and needed to hear that Jesus saves, that the Bible is the good book, and that God's word comes to pass. They also needed to hear that God takes disappointments and uses them to become appointments. Maybe something has disappointed you in life, Maybe a friend, a job, a situation, and you've been hurt, broken, bruised, and you're afraid to trust again. I'm asking you to trust Jesus. They said, but we had trusted. We hoped that it would have been he which would have redeemed Israel. Let me just say this. They jacked the text up. They thought that he came the first time to tear down Rome because Rome was an oppressive power. And so what they wanted was a military Barabbas. And that's why they said, give us Barabbas. Because they wanted somebody who would be able to deal with Rome. And so when he allowed himself to be crucified, they said, what's this? Because they had a misinterpretation of his first coming. At his first coming, he came to die for us. At his second coming, he's coming to, read, to get us and take us home. What are you saying? So today, he's already died for you. Right now, he lives for you, and one day, he wants to come back for you. Today, while heads are bowed, eyes are closed, I wonder if there's a man, a woman, boy, or girl who wants to say, Lord, I need hope like that. My hope has been crushed, but today, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Somebody today want to say, Pastor, just pray for me. I'm not joining your church. I just want you to pray for me because I, 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 I need God in my, in my life like that. Praise God for you. Somebody else today? Praise God for you, ma'am. So, praise God for you. You need, you need God to, to speak to you, praise God, in the quietness, praise God for you, in the quietness of your heart, when nobody else matters, but your eternal destiny is at stake. You need somebody who can redeem you, somebody who can transform you, somebody who can direct yourself, your steps, somebody who can guide you, somebody who can save you, somebody who can liberate you, somebody who promises to be with you, in the midnight hour, somebody, when it's darkness all around, who can be your light. Somebody else today, say, I need, I need Jesus in my life like that. Just raise your hand, I want to pray for you. Just raise your hand, put your hand up high. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Praise God for you, because it's the power. Praise God for you. It's the power of God unto salvation. Uh, let, me let, me, let me ask you something. Do I look like a sad Adventist? I'm an Adventist, and I got joy. And I want to be a good advertisement for Jesus because he's all that and some. Can I get a witness? He'll set you free. He has a purpose for your life. And that purpose is to get yourself straight so that you can help somebody else. So I'm going to ask those of you who had the courage to raise your hand, just stand. 
heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's just pray. We're going to pray for these folks. You raise your hand. Just stand. Forget, forget everybody else. They don't have a heaven for you or a hell for you. All, you, all those hands that went up, put, stand up on your feet. I want to have prayer with you. And others of you who say, Pastor, I need special prayer like that. I want God to transform my disappointments into appointments. I've had a hard time not getting bitter, but getting better. So by the grace of God, you want God to touch something in your life today and transform it, change it, so that it doesn't make you bitter, but better. He can transform it. He can take that thing. You may have tried to fix it, but God can handle it. He can move it if he has to. Or he can give you the power to deal with it. Somebody else want to get real with God today? I said, Lord, I, I, I'm letting you handle this one for me. Touch it. Break it if you have to. Smash it. But then build me back up today. Somebody else today? By the grace of God?